Welcome, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Great, well thanks for having me today, Brian, and I'm really excited to talk with you about the 2021 STI guidelines that were recently released in July. There are several updates that I'm going to go through pretty quickly, but I will welcome questions at the end and would love to have a, a discussion. These are my disclosures, and I want to just acknowledge my colleagues, Dr. Ina Park, Dr. Roz Plasker, and Dr. Hillary Liss, who contributed to some of these slides. So I'm going to just go through the top eight changes because I have a little time to the 2021 guidelines. And this is excluding all of those topics that were previously covered. I know last week you had Dr. Chase Cannon on who talked about syphilis and vaginal discharge syndromes. And you've also covered gonorrhea extensively in the past is my understanding. So these are the other top eight. So the first thing to note is just the name change. We wore the STD treatment guidelines, and now we are the STI guidelines. And I think this represents a shift in the field, again, away from thinking about sexually transmitted diseases, which are always the manifestation of, of having the pathogen, to recognizing that many of our sexually transmitted infections are asymptomatic much of the time, and that really relates to how we treat them and how we manage them. We're doing a lot more prevention as well. We're also, I think STI is a little less stigmatizing. And so we're all working to talk about STIs instead of STDs. There are several ways that the guidelines have tried to become more inclusive in this round. One is in their updated guide to taking a sexual history. We have the five Ps as the CDC framework. And rather than asking partners, men, women, or both, which has been the standard for a long time, they've switched to what is the gender of your sexual partners. So I think that's just a nice, a nice change that is more inclusive, as well as thinking about pregnancy intention rather than asking about pregnancy prevention, realizing that some people may be trying to get pregnant. In addition, there are some specific screening guidelines for transgender persons, and these are based on current anatomy and gender of sex partners. Recommendations are really to offer HIV screening to all transgender persons and to think of the risk for transgender persons who are having sex with cisgender men is similar to STIs among cisgender MSM partners. For transgender women who've had a vaginoplasty, looking at GC and CT at all sites of exposure is recommended. And it doesn't really specify whether you should be using urine or a swab if there's a neovagina. But if anogenital tissue has been used to make the neovagina, you can just go ahead and do that type of swab. For transgender men post metoidioplasty, if the vagina is still present, you can still use a cervical and vaginal swab. There's also some additional guidance around EPT. For a long time, EPT, it's been hotly contested if you should offer EPT to men who have sex with men. And they've become more permissive in that language, saying that EPT should be offered to all patients with chlamydia and if providers can't ensure that the sex partners can be treated. As well, they do recommend that there is a shared decision-making discussion for MSM, the part of the reason why we haven't wanted to offer EPT for MSM is the fear that we'll be missing other infections and or HIV. And so having that discussion when you're offering EPT is recommended. But I think this is a big step forward. Okay, let's get into some of the treatments. So doxycycline is now the preferred treatment for chlamydia. And I think this goes with a general theme in that single dose therapy is no longer the king of STI treatment. And sometimes we realize that we need to do courses of therapy. So the recommended regimen for chlamydia infection is now doxycycline 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days. There are still alternative regimens, azithromycin one gram once or levofloxacin. You can be aware that there is a doxycycline delayed release formulation that can be available, can be associated with decreased GI side effects, but is also more expensive. So what's the evidence base? Why are we shift, making this huge shift, which is very interesting? Well, for 
Urogenital chlamydia, both doxy and azithro are highly effective. There is a randomized controlled trial performed in showing 100% cure rates with doxy and 97% with azithro. So high rates of cure with both. But, and so there are situations with urogenital infection where azithromycin may still be used. That can be in pregnancy. It can be for people who are maybe not able to adhere to a seven-day regimen. I've heard a lot of providers who care for adolescents having concerns about doing a seven-day course of therapy. So there may be some situations with urogenital that you still consider azithro. Of course, allergy or intolerance to doxy would be another reason. This is in contrast to rectal chlamydia, where azithromycin really is inferior to doxy. Um, this is a study done by Julie Dombrowski here at University of Washington, a multi-center study that looked at treating MSM with rectal chlamydia, randomized either to azithro or doxy. And what you can see is at two and four weeks, you have much higher cure rates with the doxycycline as compared to azithro. So for takeaway for rectal chlamydia, azithromycin really is inferior and doxycycline should be used in that situation. Okay, next is mycoplasma genitalium. We have some more diagnostics and more resistance to discuss. So it's been determined that more than one in four men with urethritis actually have mycoplasma genitalium. So that's quite a prevalent infection among that population. However, population-based screening for MGen is not recommended, and that's because we don't really know in the setting of no symptoms what the long-term consequences of having this pathogen are. The diagnostic testing, which is becoming more and more widely available, was FDA-approved in 2019. It's a NAT, and it can be used on most urogenital specimens. So you want to test for this infection when there's persistent urethritis that fails initial treatment and also consider for people with a vagina persistent PID or cervicitis. And the reason that we're not wanting to treat at the outset is because there is significant resistance with this organism. In one recent study, multi-center, 64% of MGen had acquired macrolide resistance and 11.5% had fluoroquinolone resistance. 8% of isolate samples were resistant to both. So that is a really resistant pathogen. In terms of how do we treat MGen given these resistance patterns? Well, we're hoping that resistance testing is going to be available at some point, and it is available at some institutions and in some settings, but it's really not widely available yet. If it is possible, you start with using doxycycline in either scenario to decrease the bacterial burden. Seven days of doxycycline will decrease the burden of MGENT. And then if you know it's macrolide susceptible, you'd use azithromycin. If it's macrolide resistance, you would use moxifloxacin. If you don't have that testing available, you would do doxycycline for seven days followed by moxy. For seven days. So this is a 14-day treatment course. It's a lot of antibiotics, and we really want to make sure we're treating it when we know it's causing infection. Okay, next, metronidazole. Is, we, we have now really great clinical trial data that shows that it should be used for people with PID. So the recommended regimen for PID is ceftriaxone or cephalosporin if you need to use orals with doxycycline and metronidazole, 500 milligrams twice a day for 14 days. So no longer need to have that question of whether you should add metronidazole. What's the data behind that? Well, as I mentioned, a randomized controlled trial of 233 cis women who were randomized to metronidazole or placebo. The primary outcome was clinical improvement at three days, and then they had secondary outcomes looking at anaerobic organisms in the endometrium, as well as persistent cervical motion tenderness and pelvic tenderness. What they found is their primary outcome was not different between the two arms, but they had decreased carriage of anaerobes in the endometrium at 30 days, significantly less, and significantly fewer symptoms. And based on these data, it is now recommended to use metronidazole for outpatient patients with PID.
Okay, next, general herpes. This, as many of you know from the past, is near and dear to my heart. Just a reminder that HSV2, the main cause of general herpes, is extremely prevalent in the United States. Over 18 million cases in 2018, with over half a million new cases in that same year. When we're diagnosing HSV2, we think of a difference whether or not there's a lesion present. So if there's a lesion present, type-specific HSV PCR is the preferred diagnostic test if it's available to you. It is, culture is really less sensitive, and so we want to use the most sensitive test. In the absence of a lesion, we have to turn to serologic testing in the blood to determine whether people are infected with HSV. And this is where we get into a lot of pitfalls because our, our serologic testing is not perfect. What's recommended is to do a two-step serologic testing when you're doing HSV testing. The HSV serologic testing that's widely available is an EIA enzyme immunoassay or chemiluminescent immunoassay. And it gives index values, which is kind of a quantitative degree of the strength of the antibody response. What we found is when the index value is less than three, the specificity or the false positive rate of the test is very high. The specificity is only about 40%, so worse than a coin flip. When it's three or greater, it is improved, but still there can be false positive tests even at higher index values. If you're getting a low index value, confirmatory testing is really advised. The issue is that the confirmatory testing is not widely available, and so this is a huge problem with HSV diagnostics. And really, the take-home is either offer the confirmatory testing, or if it's not available to you, have that conversation with your patient at the outset and so that they're aware that they may have a false positive test or may have a test that's actually non-diagnostic. Okay, penicillin allergy, that they kind of brought out this section in this version of the guidelines as another opportunity for antimicrobial stewardship and really encouraging people to take an allergy history if people are reporting a penicillin allergy rather than just not treating them with penicillin for syphilis or ceftriaxone for gonorrhea. And there's a nice box here showing the low-risk histories in patients with allergies which may make you feel better about giving penicillin or ceftriaxone in that setting. They also talked about using skin testing and the increased availability of skin testing if you do have someone that you're worried about an IgE-mediated reaction that, that you'd be more worried about giving in the outpatient setting. So please do look at that section. Finally, the other thing I wanted to highlight is just thinking about early detection for anal cancer. And they're actually recommending a digital anorectal exam for MSM as part of an early potential early detection if you have any masses that you're palpating. We're still waiting for the anchor study and other studies to show whether we can use anal pap smears to screen, and those data are not yet available, so we are not recommending that at this time. But please do think about doing the digital anorectal exam. In my last couple of minutes, I just want to make people aware of a couple of resources. The National STD Curriculum is available. The website is shown here. There's CE available, and this is created by Dr. David Spock here at University of Washington, who also did the National HIV Curriculum, and it's that same incredible quality of work and a really great way to learn. We do have the STD Clinical Consultation Network, where you can, if you have tough STI questions, you can log in here and it will go to one of the experts and you'll get a response in one to five days as you specify. So that's a great response. We do have posters for extra general testing and we'd be happy to share those with you if you just let us know and we can ship some out to you. Finally, this is acknowledgement for the Mountain West AETC and I think I will end there and take any questions. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.